Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. When Christ died on the cross for your sins, He was buried and rose again the third day. You would believe and trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. He would save you from sin, save you from the wrath of God. Why don't you trust in Him? Believe on Him. Don't wait another minute. Trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope. And we are on a Romans Overview series. We are on a part 132. We're kind of moving right along in this thing. We're in Romans 13, close towards the end, about the close of the chapter. And uh, we are dealing in the topic of wine and strong drink. We're dealing in drunkenness. We're dealing in the justification of drinking wine in the Bible that people use to corrupt the text and make the Bible say what it does not say. So that's going to be our topic, and we had already done uh, possibly three or four scopes already on wine, and you can watch those. I re-upload those to the YouTube channel of KJV Bible Scope, okay? So you guys can uh, watch those, or you can go back on the Periscope and watch the replays of Scope 131 and 130 and 129, and you can see uh, the topic of this wine study. Now, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to open up with... Romans 13, and let's go ahead and flip the screen and have a look at it, okay? And then we're going to get into our topic of wine and strong drink, okay? So let's go ahead and go to Romans 13, and we're going to get our context here, and look at verse 11, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Now here it is, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. And to put a cherry on the top of this thing, look at verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Do you guys see that? What do we got? Walking honestly. So if you're in drunkenness, are you walking honestly? You're not. You're not walking honestly. And see, this is the kind of stuff people don't want to study. They just want to read over it really quick and then say, I'm a Christian just like everybody else. As you head out to the bar, as you head out to the club, as you head out to the football game with your six pack of beer. See, that's the problem, guys. People want to define Christianity by how the world defines it. You know what we need to do? We need to define Christianity the way God defines Christianity. You're not a Christian because your daddy's a Christian. You're not a Christian because your mommy's a Christian. You're not a Christian because all the people you know are Christians. You're a Christian by means of being a follower of Jesus Christ according to the Bible. Come on, you're not a Christian if, you're, if you have a six-pack headed for a football game. Christians don't do that. You're not a Christian if you're bringing home strange women and sleeping with them. You're not a Christian. Now, what do people confuse Christianity with? Getting saved. Okay, let's do this really quick before we dive into this thing. Notice we're getting on the term Christian. We're not getting on the, the term salvation because when I say you ain't a Christian, right away people default to the, to the spot. Well, you're trying to say I'm not saved. I didn't say you weren't saved. What I said was you're not a Christian because a Christian means Christ-like. 
There's a lot of saved people out there that aren't Christians. A lot of people that go to church that aren't Christians. You know why? Because when they leave that church house, they leave all of the, of the teaching and everything they learned behind. And their real life starts off when they leave the church house and they're headed for home. They're turning on that TV. They're watching those rated R movies. They're, they're engaged in those, those, uh, those wicked media sites. That's not Christianity, my friend. You're lying to yourself. You're, you're, you're living a charade. Christianity is something that's genuine and sincere. And it's a relationship you'd have with your creator. And it only comes through Jesus Christ. Now, I, now again, we, we're not talking about a salvation issue here. What we're talking about is a relationship issue. You could be saved and have no relationship to Jesus Christ at all in your life. You could be saved and live your life like the devil and you'd still go to heaven. The reason being is because Jesus saved you. Now, let me give you the example really quick. Say you're in an airplane and the airplane's about to crash and your father's on the airplane and he has supplied a parachute that you didn't know he had. And he says, put this on, son, jump out the airplane, pull the cord and you'll be saved. And then he says, now put this little piece of paper in your pocket and you put the paper in your pocket and you jump out the airplane. Now, the plane crashes because your father only supplied one parachute and your dad dies with the airplane. Your dad gave his life for you. Did he not? Yes, he did. Now, will there ever be a time in your life where you could live a certain way where it would make it untrue that your dad supplied you with that parachute that day to jump out of the airplane to be saved? Is there, will there ever be a time when you can live your life a certain way where that, that would be untrue because of how you lived your life? It would, it, there would never be a time when you could, you could live a certain way and then the clock would turn back miraculously and say, well, because you didn't live, come on, time says, because you didn't live this certain way for your father, um, we're going to put you back on the airplane and now your father's not going to give you the parachute and you're going to go ahead and die in the airplane crash. That, come on, that's stupid, okay? That, uh, that needs to be said, it is stupid. Nobody's saying that. So when Jesus Christ saved you, when he died on the cross for your sins, it's the same thing. People say, people say that is not, that's not the same thing. It's the same thing. When, when, you're, when Jesus Christ saves you from your sin in one act of faith and belief in Jesus Christ, you are saved forever, even if you live for the devil. Because that moment in that time, you sincerely believed and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, that's the point of contention we need to get on. Did you truly believe and trust in Jesus Christ? And if you truly trusted in Jesus Christ, then there's nothing that can take your salvation away from you. Even if you lived for the devil. But here's what people say. Well, well, if you, you're truly saved, you live for Jesus Christ. No, no, you won't. There's people that are saved, don't, don't know how to live their lives for Jesus Christ. That's why you got verses like 2 Timothy uh, 3.16 and uh, give me the other one, 2 Timothy 4.2. Uh, 4, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all law, suffering, and doctrine. Why do you need to preach the word to the saved if they already got it all figured out? Come on, if they're all living holy lives because you said when somebody gets saved, they automatically better live a holy life or they're not saved and then... You're, you're not giving them leeway to learn how to live a creature, a new, a new Christian life as a new creature. You're not even giving them the opportunity to learn. So we start off as babies. Come on, that's all practical. We start off as babies. And what do babies do? Babies don't know nothing. Babies got to grow. They got to get milk. And, and then as they grow taller and, and bigger and they start understanding more, you teach them more things. That's what we're dealing with in Christianity. Because you're saved and you, you go out and you commit a sin or you're, you're out at a bar or you're out at a club, doesn't make you unsaved. Now, let's rightly divide this thing. Because we're not, we're not justifying that. We're not saying that's okay for baby Christians to go out to the bar. What we're saying is the baby Christians need to humble themselves and they need to get under the teaching of grown adult Christians with meat in the Lord and giving them the proper nourishment for them to grow in the Lord and say, wait a minute, baby Christian, you're going out there. Don't go there anymore. Well, why? Well, let's do a Bible study. This is why. 
And as you in love and in patience, show them the truth. They are able to grow in the Lord, even though they were still sinning. Even though they were still going out to the bar, even though they were still taking home women to sleep with, they didn't know how to live their lives for Jesus. And now they're understanding because they're getting discipleship, they're getting fellowship, they're going to church, and you're, you're, you're encouraging them. And now they're starting to understand, wait a minute, I sinned in this area. Let me pray and confess my sins, and God is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, 1 John chapter 1. You see how easy that is? But for you to say you can't sin anymore, come on, if that guy's over there, come on, what do we always do as, as Christians? We look at somebody else and we say, well, there's no way they could be saved because they did that. Guys, that's not, that's not how you judge Christians. Now, we, are we to judge Christians? Absolutely. 1 John chapter 5 tells you we ought to judge Christians. Are we to judge lost people? Well, only according to righteous judgment, according to the gospel, Romans chapter 2, Mark 16, 15, and 16. Uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Okay? Now, that's only the gospel. We preach that Christ died for their sins and rose again the third day. And my judgment call is this, that if you trust that and believe on that, you are saved. As I'm preaching to lost people on the street, which I don't really know who's lost and who's saved, all I can do is assume everybody lost and hope they'll hear the gospel message if they're lost and then receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that he died for their sins and rose again the third day. Now, I do that with the integrity of obeying the Bible. I do that with the integrity of not assuming everybody's saved. Because you can't assume everybody's saved. That's why we preach the gospel to the lost out there in the street. That's why we preach the gospel in other countries. Because we can't assume everybody knows the gospel. So we have to assume everybody lost until they come up to us and say, wait a minute, I am saved. Oh, you are? How did you get saved? Well, I trusted that um, I was baptized in water and, and then I got saved by believing that the water saved me. And that's not salvation. You're still yet in your sins. And that's why I asked you that because I needed to make sure you had the right way. So here's the right way. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. You only got to believe on that. There it is. So that's, that's the judgment. That's, the ju that's what Christians are supposed to judge. And in the church, we're supposed to judge other Christians that are sinning against the church, that are sinning against God, that are sinning against their families, that are sin just out there sinning. We are, as a church member in the body of Christ, come on, we are supposed to reach out to our brother and sister in Christ and correct them and let them know that this sinning can't go on. Or they're going to end up being put out of the congregation. They're going to be put out of the church. Now, when I say put out of the church, I mean disfellowshipped. We're not fellowshipping with them anymore. They could never be put out of the body of Christ because once you're saved, you're in the body forever. But what we're saying is in that local assembly and congregation of believers, you can't be part of us anymore because you need to get that thing right. You need to repent. Well, that's hateful, dude. I don't think, I don't think Jesus would do that. Well, you, obviously you never read the Bible. The Bible teaches that as Christian conduct in the New Testament. Oh, well, well, I don't read, I don't really read the New Testament that much. Well, well that, that's why. That's why you don't understand it. You've never heard it because you never read it. And nobody's ever taught it in any of the churches you've ever been to. So because nobody's taught it, does it not make it true? No, what makes it true is if it's in the Bible. Guys, we got to believe the Bible. We don't believe what our churches teach if they're not lined up with the Bible. You better leave your church if they're not teaching the Bible. Leave that church. Well, I don't think you ought to say that. You got an ordained man of God there teaching me. No, he, no, he's not. It's what you call it. That's your heart. You're judging that. No, no. You got to believe the Bible. And if you got to believe the Bible and you're reading your Bible every day and you, end up in a, you're, and you ended up at a church that doesn't teach the Bible, they're teaching against it. You got to leave that church. That's not a church. A church wouldn't be teaching somebody contrary to the word of God. What you have is a establishment of people, a secular establishment of people that are getting together for a, a pep rally. Come on, a church is a body of believers that believe the word of God. 
So you need to get out of that congregation. You need to get out of that secular body of, of believers in philosophy. And you need to get under rightly divided teaching of a person that actually believes the Bible. Okay? Come on, you don't got to go to my church. Come on. I mean, I'm not really. I'm, I'm on here winning converts by the millions. You get maybe one, one to five people watching me on a scope. Really? And people think I'm out for a popularity contest. I'm really not. <laughs> if I was out for a popularity contest, I'd say just do whatever your heart feels like you need to do. And God's okay with that. He'll put his arm around you and say, good job. Me and you are like that. You know, remember, I'm the man upstairs. Yeah. It, no, guys, no. That's not what it is. Now, I said all that. So when we get into this thing, you understand that we're dealing in Christian conduct. We're not dealing in salvation. Do you understand that? If you're on my scope today and you're lost and undone, this, this message is not for you. This message is not for you. This message is solely for believers that have trusted that Christ died for your sins and rose again the third day. This message is for you. Okay, now if you're lost and undone, get off the scope. Don't watch this because if you stop drinking, you'll still die and go to hell as, as somebody that stopped drinking. You, you'll still end up in hell anyways. If you stop drinking today and you didn't trust Jesus, you transforming your life by your own devices, by trying to be good, by refraining from certain sins, isn't, isn't going to make you go to heaven. Isn't going to reconcile you to God. It isn't going to give you imputed righteousness. None of that, no work we can do, whether good or evil will get us right with God. Okay. What we need to do is trust solely on Jesus. And that's it. Now, after you've trusted Jesus, after you believed on what he did for your sins and you're saved, now we're going to focus on living a holy life for Jesus Christ, in which it's not okay to be a homosexual. It's not okay to smoke one blunt, even if it's just one blunt. It's not okay to use foul language. It's not okay to say, oh my God, oh my word, oh good Lord. It's not okay to use the Lord's name in vain, even if, even if you say you're using it in a Christian kind of a cursing sense. Come on, they call this Christian cursing. Okay, but 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 our topic today is wine. So we're not saying you can go and drink one drink. Now, now, now what, what was most preachers argument be? Well, you can you can, you know, don't drink it, but you can, you know, adult Christians can drink a little bit in moderation. No, 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 they can't. What you're trying to do as a preacher is you're trying to conform to the world. You want people to still come to your church and you still want people to pay that tithe money because you won't preach truth. You won't preach righteousness. No, we don't want them to drink one drink. One drink defiles the believer. One drink, a little bit of leaven, leaven of the whole lump. Come on, that's dealing for the whole congregation. If one sinner in the whole congregation is leaven, we need to deal with that sinner. We need to, we say, hey, look, you can't come back. You're not going to defile the rest of the congregation. One drink defiles the whole body. Isn't one drink dealing with leaven? Isn't one drink dealing with rotting fruit? Isn't one drink defiling the body? Sure it is. Well, I don't really think it defiles the body when you're drunk after you drink in excess of, of drink. No, one drink makes you a drunk. How many murders make you a murderer? How many murders? Is 10? Come on. If do you if you do it excessively, if you if you commit murder excessively, then you're a murderer. Come on. Or do you only got to commit one murder to be a murderer? How many? How many times do you need a gossip to be a gossiper? Do you have to be an excessive gossiper or does it only take one time to gossip for you to be a gossiper? There you go. See, people only want to apply th this logic to the wine, right? The fermented wine. Now, we're not even talking about unfermented wine. We're talking about fermented wine, the rotting fruit, the thing that would defile you. People want to apply this logic to only that one, that one sin that they have to justify because they're going to have to start changing their lives if you start mentioning, don't drink one drink. And they're, you know what they're going to say in their heads? Well, I have drinking one drink. So 
How dare you, Brother Ed? How dare you attack me on this? So what are they going to do? They're going to leave me a hundred emails. Well, I don't think one drink makes you a drunk. Actually, it, it wasn't even that that they said. Here's what they said. They said, Brother Ed, you said that one drink makes you drunk. I didn't say that. One drink gets you drunk. I didn't say that either. Yeah, there, Bob, but that's the problem. Um, you didn't watch my prior scopes. You jump in right in the middle of a scope series. Did you? All right, let me ask you this. Did you watch scope 128? I'll ask you that. Did you watch scope 128? 129, 130. Yes or no? Well, there you go. You can't sit here and jump in on my scope in the middle of a study. I already covered all that. Okay? That's the point. You can't sit there and jump jump in a scope and say, well, Jesus turned the water into wine. And I, I just covered all that. And here we go again. Somebody gets in a scope and expects me to tear down my Bible study just to answer their question. And, that, and this is a Bible study. Now, you're welcome to stay in the Bible study. And even though I will cover that, I, look, I'm not going to appeal to every time somebody feels like, well, I'm bored. I want to enter into this guy's study and tear it up. It's not going to happen, okay? So we're not going to appeal to running the scope around you, okay? So I hope you take that in a good spirit. We're going to study the Bible, okay? So let's do this. Romans 13. Here's what it says. One drink makes you a drunk. And drunkenness is a sin. Romans 13, 11. And that knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. Do you see that? How many drinks does it take to be a drunk? One drink. And you are not walking honestly if you say that is not true. Because God's definition of drunkenness is different from the Western culture's definition of drunkenness. Absolutely no alcohol as a Christian. Now, now let me say this. Let me say this because I always say this. And obviously you don't watch my scope, so you don't know I always say this. Now, look at the screen. Look at the screen. And if you can, turn your screen sideways so you can get a better picture of this. The Bible definition of wine. You have on the left side, you have miracle wine made from water. You ain't drinking that, friend. You haven't drank anything Jesus tur turned from water to wine. Come on. What people want to use is say, well, Jesus turned the water into wine so I can drink Jack Daniels. No, you can't. You're, Jesus didn't turn the water into Jack Daniels. Okay, the miracle wine made from water, only Jesus made this wine, John 2, 9. Nobody else can reproduce this wine. Come on, are you going down to the, to the, to the alcohol store and you're buying wine made from water? No, you're not. And, and even more so, you're not buying wine made from water that Jesus turned the water into wine. See, only Jesus can do that miraculous miracle. And you ain't, you ain't drinking that wine today. That only happened one time in his first advent. That was it. Nobody else is drinking that wine today. Now look at the second category. Look at the middle. I broke it off into three categories. Now, now watch this. The first one is do not drink strong drink. That's Jack Daniels right there. And you could put wine cooler, Seagrams, any, any, any intoxicating fermented beverage you can stick right there and you know what leviticus 10 10 says to put difference between holy and unholy between clean and unclean so this strong drink is called wine but what but what jesus turned the water into was wine but now let's keep going now watch this look at the nyquil in the middle of the screen this is medicine for internal and that's 1 Timothy 5.23. This is where Timothy has taken a little wine for the infirmities in his stomach. Guess what? Guess what it's called? It's called wine. And there's a huge difference between NyQuil and Jack Daniels. Let me give you another one. Medicine. Look, 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 look at the medicine for external on the right side of the middle chart. This is ethanol. Ethanol, or, or it's also called ethyl, E-T-H-Y-L. 
Now, this, this rubbing alcohol is used for external use. Notice I'm not using the word isopropyl. Isopropyl is made out of propane gas. And it's mixed with water, and then it goes on, undergoes a fermentation process that goes undergoes sulfuric acid. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something used externally that's made from rotting fruit. And that's what ethanol is. Okay? Rubbing alcohol. And you know what it's called? Look at the top. Look at the yellow letters. It's called wine. Nope. Uh, that's why we're doing this conclusive Bible study right now. So you didn't watch Scope 128. We're covering all those, what you call alleged full verses, all these verses of c condoning drinking. No, what we're doing is we're covering those verses right now. And we're proving that you don't understand those verses. See, you say the Bible is full, but you didn't give one verse. See that? That's the kind of, of carnal Christianity we're dealing with. Now, I don't even want to know if you're, I don't even know if you're a Christian. See, that, that, see, this is the problem. We got people jumping into a scope. I don't even know if they're saved. See, I don't know if you're saved, let alone a Christian. And then you're going to sit here and, and you're going to try to make comments about wine that you probably know nothing about. Yeah, but are you not a priest, Bob? Come on, if you're saved. I don't, I don't even know if you're saved. Are you a priest? Yes or no? Am I a priest? Come on, let me ask this. I'm saved. I believed in Jesus Christ. Am I a priest? Yes or no? We'll see how much Bible you know. Are you, am I a priest, yes or no? Come on, if you want to have this conversation, we'll have it. Are, am I a priest, yes or no? Now, when I say I, I mean all, all saved people, okay? That's what I mean by priests. Are all saved people priests, yes or no? I can, come on, you're stalling on me now. Come on, you know the Bible so well. Come on, don't stall on me. This is KJV Bible Scope, my friend. Um, again, Bob, you didn't answer my question. Come on, you're Mr. Knowledgeable. Am I a priest as a member of the body of Christ? Yes or no? Yes or no? I got the answer for you. Am I a priest? Yes or no? Come on. I mean, you're taking too long, man. As a, as a man of God, as a man knowing the Bible, you're taking entirely too long to answer this. Come on. This is general knowledge. Okay. So if I'm a priest, if I'm a priest, I'm not supposed to be drinking one drop of it, am I? There you go. There you go. See? See how easy that is? Easy, guys. Easy. All right. So we did... Jack Daniels, we did NyQuil, we did medicine for external, and these are all called wine. And Jesus turning the water into wine, even though none of us are drinking that today. Now look at the last category there, the very last category. We've got unfermented wine made from fresh fruit. This is what you can buy at your local store. It's called grape juice. Grape juice. Do you see that? It's 100% grape juice. This wine you can give to your children. Isaiah 65, 8. It's called new wine. What happened to our friend? Did he leave? He sure did. I'm telling you guys, pe people want to justify their drinking alcohol. See, they don't want to listen to the Bible study. They want to justify, they don't want to justify drinking. They don't care about Jesus Christ. They care about drinking. They don't want to be holy. They care about drinking. Okay, we're going to finish this off because I put this chart on for the individual that was on here, but we're going to keep going, okay? So we got our, on our last group right here, we have unfermented wine made from fresh fruit. Do you see that? This is Welch's grape juice, okay? Now, all three of these categories, now you can see there's actually five mentionings of wine right there on my chart, and I've given you verses to go along with it. And there's only three categories, though. There's the first category that Jesus turned the water into wine and nobody's drinking that today. But the middle category depends on motive. Now, you, if your motive is to say, well, you know, Timothy took some wine for his stomach, for his infirmity. So therefore I can drink Jack Daniels. That's your motive, my friend. And you know, that's entirely and completely unjust and unrighteous argument. Because Jesus Christ did not turn the water into Jack Daniels. 
He turned the water into wine, which is better than the new wine that's made from fresh fruit. And that means it's not fermented. Do you see that? Now, the other people want to give the argument because when, when their little boy or little girl gets cut in the knee, they get rubbing alcohol out, some, some, some ethanol, and then they clean out the wound of their child's knee. Now, come on, guys. People don't normally do this, but you could see them uh, posing this argument after learning um, or trying to justify their drink. They pretty much say anything to justify drinking alcohol, right? So they would say, well, because I cleaned little Billy's knee when he got hurt with rubbing alcohol, that's justification for me to drink Jack Daniels. Do you see that? That's what people do. They justify drinking alcoholic beverages that the Bible says will defile you. So what, what would be the sanction for the only kind of wine that would be acceptable for you to drink? It would be when you're sick, right? That would be Timothy. That would be him taking NyQuil for his stomach's sake. Now, we don't know if he drank NyQuil. We don't know what the med medicinal uh, medicine was at the time of Timothy. But whatever he took, it wasn't Jack Daniels and it was any, no, nothing like Jack Daniels. It wasn't a wine cooler. It wasn't so he could take it so he could moderately drink. No, what he did was he had medicine for his stomach's sake. That's what he had. Now, look at the third one. The third one is medicine for external right there. And again, nobody can intake that one okay but what people will do is even though they can use wine in the context of rubbing alcohol they'll say because we have rubbing alcohol that's called wine it's okay for me to drink jack daniels do you see that so what we have in our in our third category there is unfermented wine made from fresh fruit come on the welch's grape juice and this is the kind of wine you can drink you can drink as much of this wine as you want and you won't get drunk. Right? Come on. The Bible defines this great fresh fruit squeezed into a cup or squeezed into a, a, a container. It's called wine. People don't like that because it destroys them from wanting to drink. It destroys their justifications for wanting to live this wicked lifestyle that they don't, that they, they desire to live. Come on, it's going to destroy your whole social um, gatherings. Come on, when all your friends realize that you can't even drink one drink, you think they're still going to want to hang out with you? Probably not. So guess what you're going to do? You'd rather hold on to your friends than to hold on to holiness. You'd rather hold on to your friends than to hold on to, to, to loving God. The Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And you would love your beer and your peer pressure more than you'd love Jesus Christ. And that's, that is the truth. Come on. When you get on my scope, you're going to hear truth guys. Nobody on, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. Okay. That's the truth. You not, you may not want to hear the truth, but that's the truth. All right. So there we did it. I told you once a, once a scope, we're going to throw this chart up as long as we're in this wine study. Well, I'm going to throw this chart up there so people know they have no excuse to be drinking fermented alcoholic beverages at all. At all. There you go. Amen. So we opened up with that. Now, now look, look let's go back to our screen here really quick. Now, now look at this. Let us walk honestly. As in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness. Now, what is chambering? Does anybody know what chambering is? I mean, I mean, come on. What is chambering? And we see the word wantonness there. So chambering, um, here, let me give you a little definition here. The fact that men and women read the words of God and pass right over those, they do not know um, they do not know is a sad commentary on the general lack of hunger. For knowledge of the holy. Upon reading Romans 13, 13, like we just read, one must ask, what is chambering? But should we not do more than wonder? To chamber is to indulge in lewd or immodest behavior. Guess what happens when you're drunk? You're engaged in, come on, what we just said, lewd and immodest behavior. There you go. With, look, 
For details, turn on the television, visit a, a mall, or stop by a public high school. Come on. You can watch all those things. You can go to all those places, and you will see the result of drunkenness right there. Alongside this uh, word is wantonness. This is licentiousness without restraint. There is still some measure of restraint upon the men and women in once God-fearing lands, but the farther a society wanders from submission to absolute truth, the more prevalent lewd conduct becomes in every sphere of public life. Come on, people want this lifestyle. People want this chambering. People want this wantonness. Come on, all this lewd, licentious behavior, Christians want to engage in that. It's wicked. You're wicked today. That's why you're not on my scope today. Come on, people that got on my scopes and know that I'm preaching on this wine topic, they're not, so I'm going to say all of them. Some people are not on because they are wicked and they know I'm going to call them wicked. Well, that's not loving, brother Ed. It's not loving to let somebody know they're wrong. It's absolutely loving when you tell somebody they're wrong. Come on. If somebody, I can't believe we got to do these illustrations. There's, guys, this is so ridiculous that you got to do an illustration like this. But you got to because people, people, it ain't the fact that people don't get it. People don't want to get it. Now watch this. If, if you're standing taking pictures off of the Grand Canyon. You're just taking pictures and you see somebody walking towards the Grand Canyon and they're blind. And there's a ledge there with no guardrail. Are you going to tell them, wait, 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 stop, sir, stop, sir. You're going to go over, wait, 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 wait. And, and try to stop him from doing that. You may even reach out your hand and judge them and tell them, whoa, I got to stop you, sir. You almost went over that edge. Now, why would you put your beliefs on that man? Why would you impose physical action against that man? Why would you do that? When you don't believe in judging people, you don't believe in reaching out to people and let alone physically touching somebody, that would be hateful, wouldn't it? So that man that stopped that man from jumping off the, or, or falling off the Grand Canyon ledge, you, you would say, wow, that's a hateful man. He stopped that man from going over the edge. That Maybe that man wanted to go over the edge. Who are you to say he was going to go over the edge? Well, the guy that saved his life says, well, he, he was about two steps away. But, but you didn't really know he was going to fall over the edge. But you went out and stopped him. You can't judge that man that way. And there you go, guys. There you go. That's, see, that's just what I'm talking about. And so when I sit here on the scope and I say, repent you're wicked repent that's wicked you need to stop doing that well that's hateful dude i, I can't believe you said that you know uh, you, you can't be calling people wicked you're gonna turn people away right exactly that's your attitude and that's the way you look at it and the way god looks at it as tell people tell people that they're headed the wrong way tell them to repent don't you know what repent means Repent means turn from the way you're going. If you're, a, if you're a saved person today, turn from the way you're going. If you're headed for darkness, drinking and getting drunk and excess of wine or even drinking one sip, you need to repent. You need to turn from that darkness and you need to come back to God. If you're not saved today, you need to repent of trusting whatever you're trusting in. And you need to turn to Jesus Christ and believe and trust in him alone. That, that's what we're talking about. And for me to say the word repent is for me to judge. For me to say the word repent is for me to say, wait a minute, you're going the wrong way. For me to say repent is for me to tell you what you're doing is wicked. You want to be righteous? Turn around and come this way. There you go. See, people don't want to hear that. You know why? Because they want to go that direction. They want to head towards sin. They want to justify heading towards sin. They want to justify as they're headed towards sin, nobody preaching against it. They want to justify that. And so who are they going to attack? Are they going to attack all the drunks that are out there that claim to be Christians? And they're going to tell them, hey, what are you doing, man? You need to stop drinking that. You need to stop. No, don't, don't be offering him a drink of wine because he may end up becoming a drunk. No, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. You guys need to repent. 
No, you know what they're going to do? They're going to tell those people that. What are they going to do? They're going to go to preachers on a street corner or preachers on a social media site, and they're going to tell them that they're hateful for calling out these people that are drunks that call, that call themselves Christians. You know why? Because they themselves are drunks, and they can't handle being called a drunk. Because what happens if you're called a drunk? Well, if by some means you are physically that drunk under the banner of the Bible, these people know they're under the condemnation of Galatians 5, which they're going to lose their inheritance in the kingdom of God. So they don't want to be called a drunk. So what are they going to try to do? They're going to try to battle and strive to find out what does it mean to be drunk. We're going to try to ride the line. We're going to try to get as close as we can to our subjective definition of drunkenness. That way we can stay a little bit behind that line and still socially drink with our friends and still drink on occasion and still drink maybe a little bit of wine for my stomach, even though I don't have an infirmity. That's what they're doing. And people don't like that. And people will leave churches because of it. People won't watch periscopes because of it. People won't watch YouTube channels that people are preaching against that because it's what the Bible teaches. Well, I'll listen to the Bible just as long as you don't preach that wine thing. Right. Exactly. It's, it's your motive. It's your motive. I should be able to preach anything in the Bible if you're a real Bible-believing Christian. And you should be able to sit there and say, wait a minute. I understand this. I, I, I'm, I'm getting his point. I'm getting that angle. i never seen that before. Instead of arguing with it, why don't you say, wait a minute. Let me listen to this. Let, let me take into account all the verses. But you know what, everybody that's, that, that's been on my scopes, everybody that's been responding to my messages didn't say, wait a minute, let, 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 let's stop for a minute. Let me just wait a couple of weeks and study this thing out. Let me wait a couple of months because it is a big study. Let me wait a couple of months and study this thing out. And after I study this thing out, then I'll leave a comment on Brother Ed's YouTube channel. Then I'll, I'll make a comment on a Periscope channel. Then I'll do that. No, no, no. You know what people do? They're in the flesh. And you know what they do? They respond right away. When I'm preaching against alcohol and strong drink, right away they respond right away. They're not going to study the verses. They're not going to look at the angle and the practical applications. You know what they're going to do? They're right away because because they're like, well, well, I drink. Wait a minute. I drink occasionally. No, this guy's saying you can't even drink one drink and you're a, you're classified as a drunk. No way. There's no way he's going to call me a drunk. No, I'm going to argue with him. Da, 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 and you start typing all that garbage in there. That's what people do. You see that? They're, guys, they're closed-minded about the Bible. See, I'm closed-minded about their social and secular activities, their social and secular philosophies. I'm closed-minded. I don't want to hear it. So what happens? There's an incompatibility problem. With what? with the secular world and Christianity. That's why I'm telling you, you can't be one foot in and one foot out. You can see people that get on my scopes, they're either two foot in or they're two foot out. You can't sit on my scopes and stay on my scopes if you don't want the Bible. Now, I've never seen it. Now, there, there may be people out there that they can sit there and still not believe anything Anything that I'm saying in the Bible about wine and still listen to it, it's very rare though. It's, it's a very rare thing because I'm going to preach holiness, guys. We're going to preach it. You are not to defile your body, whether it's one act of fornication, even one kiss, even holding a woman's hand. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, thou shalt not touch a woman. You are not to even touch her. You know what the Bible says about looking? Looking. Whosoever shall look upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You know what the Bible says about appearance that deals with looking? The Bible says abstain from the appearance of evil. That's the Bible, Fred. You, you, come on. P people ain't going to get on this scope. People ain't going to watch this. It ain't. But I'm going to preach the truth, guys. I'm going to preach the truth. Before, before I croak, before I die and my body is worm food. 
I'm going to try to preach as much truth as I can out here on this on these media sites. I'm going to try to preach as much truth as I can to tell these people that there is a better life. There's a life that the TV does not even portray. There's a life that Hollywood movies never cover. There's a lifestyle that's out there that people want to, to, re, to, to, to think in their mind as a charade that there's no such thing as any other life than what I know on social media, what I know on Hollywood movies. There is a life out here and there's a life that's being lived for Jesus Christ and I'm one of them. And people say, well, you know, the, the, the homosexual, his voice needs to be heard. Do you know, you know, you, 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 you got the transvestite, their voice needs to be heard. You know, you, you, you got the, you got the people that were, that are stuck in drugs and, and they're, and other people that are drunkards, they're in AA meetings. Well, well, they conquered this sickness, this disease, and their voice needs to be heard. You got people that conquer cancer and people that overcome this and that. And they say, well, their voice needs to be heard. But you know, there is one voice, there is one voice out there that people do not and will not hear. And that's the voice of the belief and trust in Jesus Christ and living your life for him and the ways and the statutes and the precepts thereof. They will not hear it. And they will not acknowledge that people like that exist. They will not acknowledge that these people actually believe this certain way and we know the details about what they believe. They don't even want to hear. They don't even want to acknowledge. They don't even want to repeat anything of what who we are and what we are and what we believe as Bible-believing Christians. They, 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 they stay clear from it. News broadcasters, social media, come on, any, name it, name it. Presidents, secretaries, political parties, Nobody will acknowledge, nobody will acknowledge the way, to, the way to God is only through Jesus Christ and him alone that he died for your sins and rose again the third day. That's the only way to God. That's why you got people always arguing because all they're looking at is social media and TV. They're not reading their Bible. They're not going to church under a Bible believing preacher. So what are they going to get? They're going to get everything under the sun, but the truth, the truth of the Bible. That's why, guys, haven't you noticed every time I start quoting verses and I start showing you the practical applications of these verses and you can see the context that a lot of times you get an issue with it. Why? Because you're like, oh, I never heard this before. Why haven't you heard this before? It's Bible. If you're going to church all the time, like you say you are, shouldn't you have known this much? And the problem is people's mouths drop wide when I start preaching this stuff. It's like, I never heard this before. This is amazing. Um, and, and even more so, others are like, I, I can't believe he's saying that. This isn't amazing. I got to get off this scope. I got to get out of this teaching because I don't think this is real Christianity. This is, this is a fraud. This is a fake. Because all the, the Christianity that I've ever learned on Hollywood movies, which is Really, let me get sarcastic really quick, which is really a great place to get Bible truth at Hollywood movies who hate God and they're going to portray God as some mockery and that's where you're going to get all your Christianity from. You know, Jesus had long hair and I tell you, no, he didn't. Leonardo da Vinci didn't, didn't draw Jesus, my friend. Jesus wasn't there taking a portrait with Leonardo da Vinci as he's painting him, Okay. Nobody knows what Jesus looks like. Stop drawing Jesus with long hair. Nobody knows what he looks like for the reason of what's going on when Leonardo da Vinci made that painting. People actually bow down to the image of what they think Jesus looks like. And that's what you think Christianity is. Whatever, whatever media says. Whatever the secular society says, whatever the political parties say, forget what the Bible says, right? And I'm saying that sarcastically. I speak as a man, God forbid. Guys, we need to read the Bible. When I make a comment out of the Bible, you need to say, wait a minute. Let me not jump to conclusions here. There is already a whole lot in the Bible that doesn't agree with how I grew up. There's no, I mean, how I grew up, according to media and TV and movies, there's a whole lot in the Bible that just doesn't jive with my worldview on what I think Christianity is. Let me go to the Bible and let me find out what genuine Christianity really is. 
Now, I wanted to make a pit stop there so you know the motive and the heart and the attitude of how we're going into this thing. We are, we are getting edified to believe the truth. We're not getting edified to believe more lies. We're not trying to, rub, to, to water this thing down as to appease people that still want to drink. Amen. Amen. Come on. Why do you guys make me feel bad? Are you guys judging me? You're saying that I'm wrong for trying to live a holy life by not drinking? Are you going to hurt the, come on, if I'm a weaker brethren, you're going to hurt me and tell me that it's okay for me to drink when I truly believe that you shouldn't drink? Come on, let, let, come on let's go ahead and do this really quick. You tell me what's better, somebody that drinks or somebody that doesn't drink? Let's just, come on, let's simplify this. What would be better? Come on, according to your own subjective opinion. Come on, we're not even going to the Bible right now. Let's just go by your opinion. What do you think would be better? Because now I'm appealing to your wicked heart. What do you think would be better? Would it be better to drink? Come on, strong drink, fermented wine, or to not drink it? What would be better? And you already got the answer to that. You know in the heart of your hearts, it's better not to drink it. So there you go. Why aren't you taking the higher ground to not drink it? No, because you want to drink it. <laughs> That's exactly because you don't care what the Bible says. You care about drinking wine. That's all you care about. Come on. People, people get on my scope and once they hear, don't drink even one drink, bam, they're off. They're, they're off really quick. Amen. You know why? Because they don't care what the Bible says. They care about the, the social media. They care about what what the, the consensus of society says. Who cares what the Bible says, according to these people? Right. But you got people like me who care about what the Bible says, okay? So there we go. So we got not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. But put ye on, let me flip the screen here, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. So now if you are making provision for the flesh, drinking one drink, by the way, having a taste of beer. If you drink but one drink, there's no way you're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 14. Are you drinking one drink? Are you making provision for the flesh? Are you fulfilling the lust thereof to drink one drink? Well, then there's no way you're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, I drink moderately and I put on the Lord Jesus Christ. No, you're not. You're trying to serve two masters. And the Bible says that's impossible. Either one is your enemy and you're a friend of the other. Which one are you an enemy of? And right now as people get on my scope and then they make real little snide comments and then they leave my scope because I'm telling you don't even drink one drop of it. And you know what you say? Well, I drink and I still love Jesus. Me and the man upstairs are still cool, dude. And you know what I'm telling you? You haven't put on the Lord Jesus Christ because you can't put on Jesus having taken a drink of devil drink. There's no way you can put on Jesus having done that. So, 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 so you're saying I'm not saved. I, oh, here, see, this is what I'm talking about, guys. See, you, you can't get past that because people are so carnal in their mind. They think whenever you rebuke them, you're saying they're not saved. I didn't say you weren't saved. I said you didn't put on Jesus Christ. We have to put on Jesus every day as we're walking in the spirit every day. That's what it means to be, to put on Christ. It means to be renewed in your mind every day according to the word of God. That's what it means to put him on. Now, apart from, look, oh, let's do this really quick. Apart from putting Jesus on, are you still saved if you've trusted that Christ died for your sins and rose again the third day? Yes, you're saved. See, there is an aspect of Jesus that's already in you. You don't have to put him on. You already have him in you. What we're talking about is putting on Jesus in the sense of his attributes. And you'll find Jesus' attributes in the Bible in Christian conduct according to the New Testament precepts. And when you read those and you study those and you learn those and you apply those to your life, you are putting on Jesus Christ. That's what we mean. Nobody said you weren't saved. We're saying you need to put on Jesus Christ. And if you're still drinking, you're drinking that one drop of beer. 
You have not put on Jesus Christ. You can deceive yourself all day long. And believe me, that is not a problem for people to deceive themselves. Well, I still drink and me and Jesus are still cool. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's the point I'm trying to make. You don't care what the Bible says. Look, people can murder other people and say, I'm still right with God. People can come into your house and kill your whole family and rape your kids and say, well, I'm right with God. You know, God's, it's all under grace. God still loves me. People can deceive themselves. They do it all the time. Look, the prisons are full of people deceiving themselves. Look, the world and the clubs and the bars are full of people deceiving themselves. All these people out here think that as long as you're a good person, you're going to get to a better place. Look, you reap what you sow. And they don't use those words. What do they use? Well, you got to have karma, dude. Karma. You know, what goes around comes around. It's karma, dude. Deception. Deception. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. And you as a Christian today are no different. If, come on, you call yourself a Christian when you're not. But I'm I, what, who I'm talking to right now is the people that call themselves Christians. You call yourself a Christian, you got a label there. You've got a, look, on your, look, you got a label on your shirt. It says, I am a Christian, dude. And you, you got your label there. As you're headed out to the bar, as you're headed out to the club, as you're bringing home those women to sleep with them, as you're, as you're defiling your body, as you're smoking those blunts, as you're shooting up that heroin, you're smoking that bong, you're doing all that garbage, and you got on your shirt, I'm a Christian, just like the people that are preaching out on the streets. No, you're nothing like us. No, no, you're not. No, I'm not, look, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use the, that, um, that dumb terminology. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm just saved. Why would you, why would you say that? Are you undermining the, the holiness of Jesus Christ? Are you undermining Christ in you, the hope of glory? Are you undermining the Bible that tells you you ought to be perfected every day in your life? Second Timothy three sixteen. Come on, let go all script. No, hold on. Let's look at it real quick. 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's do it. Come on. I, I, I preached a little bit here. 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's do it. Dealing in wine. Dealing in wine and strong drink. Let me flip the screen here. Look what it says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be not perfect, just forgiven, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It doesn't say that. That the man of God may be perfect. Well, I'm not perfect. I'm just forgiven. You ought to be perfect. You're not supposed to justify sinning. Well, I think if you judge people that way, you're not showing the love of God. No, you're supposed to live your life in perfection of the word of God and let people be convicted by your example. You see that? Opening your mouth for Jesus Christ and matching, opening your mouth for Jesus Christ, your lifestyle matching. Not engaging in sin, not engaging in drinking that one beer that you want to justify drinking, not drinking it, abstaining from evil and the appearance of evil. Both. Both. Why are you going to drink one drink? It may weaken your brother. Why are you going to drink? It may weaken you. Why are you going to drink? You're hurting God. Why are you going to drink? You're quenching the spirit. Why are you going to drink? You're going to hurt your family. Why are you going to drink? It may result in you being a drunk. In drunkenness. Wicked. It's wicked. You need to call wicked, wicked. You Come on, people want me to call wickedness. They want me to say, well, that's okay. God still loves you. No, you need to know it's wicked. It's unacceptable with God. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. A little bit of preaching there for you. Amen. Amen. That's a blessing, guys. Somebody that can stand up for truth, for righteousness. Amen. That's what we need to do, guys, as Christians. I want to be an encouragement to those people that aren't taking drinks. 
I want to be an encouragement to those that are unsure, that are riding the line, and they're saying, well, I don't know. I've been hearing a lot of preaching to say it's okay to drink in moderation. But then, you know, I actually heard uh, the other side of it. I never heard the other side of the argument before. This guy named Brother Ed was actually preaching and giving all these verses in the Bible. He wasn't afraid to go to any of the verses in the Bible. And he hit all these verses. And now I'm, I'm starting to get more of an objective biblical view that drinking is unacceptable. And I was riding the borderline, and now I know that I don't need to be doing that. I don't want to teach my kids that. Do you, do you understand the legacy you can bring to your kids when, when you make a stand on something as important as, as a Christian, not drinking one drink, how that can affect your children, the legacy of your family line? One drink can weaken everything. One drink can defile everything, not only your body, but everything in your life. One drink can destroy you in more ways than one. Do you see that? So, guys, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, if Scripture is supposed to do that, and we're, we're supposed to get instruction in righteousness according to the Scriptures, then where do you get the verses that say it's okay to drink and defile your body? When the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Now look, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now what is righteousness? Righteousness isn't right in your own eyes. Righteousness is right in the eyes of God. When God looks down at us, he says, when you read my word, when you read the scriptures, you are going to get righteousness right from my mind. That the man of God may be perfect. One drink, my friend, ain't making you perfect. Remember what I said before? What's better, to drink fermented wine or not to drink it? I mean, come on. If, even if you want to say one sip, is it better to take a sip or not to take a sip? What's better? Come on. We're not even going to the Bible right now. In your conscience, in the morality that God has given you, apart from the word of God, what's better, to drink a little bit or not to drink it? What's better? And in the heart of your hearts, if you're an honest person today, you will say it's always better to not do it. But what are people going to do? People are going to do it. And it doesn't matter what I say. But look what the Bible says. The instruction in righteousness in the Bible comes from the Bible, the mind of God. And he, nowhere in the Bible will he be the author of confusion to make you confused about this topic of wine. And he's going to make sure you know that there are differences between wine and the Bible. There is I gave you three definitions of wine. Grape juice, freshly squeezed grape juice is called wine. And you can go down to Walmart and you can buy Welch's grape juice and you can drink it to your heart's desire. You can drink it till you're full. You can drink it till you throw up and that's okay. You're not condemned. You can even give that to your kids. You can give wine to your kids because wine in the Bible is Welch's grape juice or that's one of the classifications of it. Now, what are you not going to give your kids? Rubbing alcohol. You're not going to give them rubbing alcohol to drink. That would probably kill them. Now, what, what else are you not? And, and that's called wine in the Bible. What else are you going to give? NyQuil. Are you, going to give your, are you going to give your child a whole gallon of NyQuil to drink? Your three-year-old baby? No, you're not going to do it. That's called wine in the Bible. What about, come on, what about Jack Daniels? Come on, if you say it's okay to drink, why don't you give your eight-month-old baby some some Jack Daniels instead of some formula. Why don't you do that if it's okay? See, you're not going to do that because it's not okay. Come on. If the government's got this thing more figured out than carnal Christians do, because look, even lost people know that Christians ought not be drinking. Lost people ought know that Christians ought not be in a bar and engaging even in moderate drinking. But yet, you know what you, you know the most of the arguments you get from? Most of the arguments you get come from carnal, wanting to justify sin Christians. And, I, and like I said, I don't even know if they're Christians. They call themselves Christians, but calling yourself a Christian don't make you no more a Christian than being in a garage makes you a car. You could call yourself a Christian to your heart's content. And if you don't have any actions to show your Christianity, you're not a Christian. 
You can deceive yourself. I said it before. You can deceive yourself and people deceive themselves all day long because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's desperately wicked. You'll deceive yourself over and over and over again until you actually believe your deception. <laughs> all right, guys. Amen. So that's some good preaching. Some good preaching for an, I, I don't want to say an opening because we didn't even start on the study yet. But guys, th these are practical principles that we need to have as we look at this wine study. Okay, here we go. So what we have is, um, in Alaska, we did Isaiah 520. We've got, um, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And that's what people do. They say, when I'm on here preaching, don't even drink one drink. These, these alleged Christians call me evil. They don't want to hear me. They won't even stay on to hear the sermon because I'm about, I'm about to give some Bible verses right now. And they don't, they don't care for those Bible verses, which means they don't care for the word of God. Now look, Isaiah 520, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They say drinking alcohol is more justified than drinking grape juice from, from Welch's grape juice. They'll say, this sweet grape juice that's called wine in the Bible is wicked. We don't want to drink that. Brother, you're trying to say I can drink as much Welch's grape juice as I can, and, and, and that's okay with God? And I'm saying, yes, drink all the Welch's grape juice you want. It's, it's freshly squeezed. It's not fermented. You can drink as much as you want. And God says it's okay to drink that wine. And you know what? You don't like that. You know what you want? You want to put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You want to say, no, the wine that God says we can drink all the time is the fermented stuff. Because Jesus turned the water into fermented alcoholic beverages. And then he was a bartender giving his alcoholic beverages to the people at the wedding. And then after all that, after before his death on the cross, Jesus Christ took the Lord's Supper, right? He took his own supper and he, and he said, this is wine. This is fermented Jack Daniels. These are wine coolers, Seagrams and all that. And he, give, he gave all, and they had a drunken party, a drunken fest. And they invited all these women and they all had sex with, see, this is the wickedness of mankind. This is the wickedness of people that don't know the difference between holy and unholy between clean and unclean and you need to repent repent of that foolishness amen how you like that preaching amen some good good bible preaching on holiness amen all right so so we did isaiah 5 20 uh, uh, yet again and then if the old testament priest because we mentioned this earlier if the old testament priest could not drink in the tabernacle of the congregation then how much more we who have the living god dwelling in our tabernacle which we said it before is our body that's our tabernacle first peter or second peter 113 and i'll show that to you um should not drink wine or strong drink to put difference between holy and unholy between clean and unclean okay so let's do it second peter 113. Let's flip the screen here. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle. Now, Peter wasn't in a tabernacle of the Lord like, like they were in the Old Testament under a tent. Okay? Look what it says. To stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. So what he's saying is this tabernacle is his body. His body is his tabernacle. And as the priests were not supposed to be drinking wine in the tabernacle, not even one drop, not even one drink in the tabernacle. So are we in this tabernacle that Jesus Christ lives within, that the Holy Spirit lives within, that God the Father lives within, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Colossians 1, And if you want the reference for um, the Father being in you, it's Ephesians 4. You can read it in Ephesians 4 close towards the end of the chapter, okay? So there you go. We got the whole triunity of God, the whole glory of God dwelling within us. And we, I'm, I'm talking about in our tabernacle, and we are not to defile the tabernacle of God. 
So we are made kings and priests unto God and his father. If the Old Testament Levitical priest couldn't drink wine and Old Testament Jewish kings couldn't drink wine because it makes you forget the law and pervert judgment, the word excess is not in the passage. Now watch this. Proverbs 31. Now look at this. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Do you see that? It's not for kings to drink. Now, do you remember what I said earlier about are we priests? Are we kings? Well, look at Revelation 1.6. We're going to do it again. We did it in the last scope. I'm just going to reiterate this again. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So if you want the context, here it is. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now you see the word us there? Did he wash you from your sins in his own blood? Come on, today. Did you, were you washed clean and made as white as snow according to Jesus Christ finished work on the cross for your sins. And, the, and, and if your answer is yes, then look at verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. There you go. He had made us kings and priests. Are we kings and priests now? And the answer is yes. Are you a king and priest now? Yes. Are you an ambassador for Christ now? Yes. There you go. So you're a king and a priest. And what do we just read in Proverbs 31? We read, it's not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Least they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. See what it does? It perverts the judgment of any of the afflicted. It makes you forget the law. It makes you forget God. It makes you forget anything you were ever taught in the Bible. It makes you unholy. It makes you unclean. What a shame, guys. People won't obey the Bible. They'll obey their flesh. They'll obey their desires. They won't obey the Bible. Now, now look. We are made kings and priests unto God. Now, do we have a backup for that kings and priests? Sure we do. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of e out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Look at verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on earth. That's your inheritance right there. By not drinking. That's your inheritance right there. By not even drinking one drop. That's your inheritance right there. Not even looking upon the wine when it is red. That's your inheritance right there. You're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Now, if all you are is saved. And you're living your life in sin. You're living your life in devil drink. You're living your life telling people to drink it. Being a bartender. Giving other people to drink. You should be ashamed of yourself. And you know what you're risking right now my friend? You're risking your inheritance. You will not be one of the ones that come back to rule and reign on earth with Jesus Christ. You'll enter the kingdom of heaven if you're born again. But you'll not reign on earth with Jesus Christ. You would have forfeited your inheritance. That's not the way to go as a Christian. You still want to teach people to drink one drink. You still want to teach people that it's okay. You still want to teach people it's not a big deal. You better be careful, my friend. You better be careful with how you handle the word of God. We do not corrupt the word of God as some do. But as of sincerity, but as of God, speak we in Christ. Friend, I'm going to speak in Christ. I'm going to speak according to the statutes and precepts of the word of God. I'm going to speak according to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for your sins and rose again the third day. The Holy One of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. He desires for us to live a holy life in him and you ain't living a holy life if you're taking swigs of beer you ain't living a holy life if you're trying to justify your lifestyle you need to submit to the word of god 
not just the parts you feel like believing. You need to submit to the word of God in all its entirety. Come on, people only want you to preach on what they feel they agree with. Come on, what about the parts you don't agree with? You just skip out on it? Do you not go to church that day? Go on, when the preacher preaches, do you say, well, you know, I don't agree with that, so I'm going to stay home today. You know, I'm not going to pray because I don't agree with prayer, so I'm going to stop praying. Yeah, you know, prayer prayer's overrated anyways. I, I don't think prayer really works. So I'm not going to pray anymore. Oh, you're telling me I got to pray? No, no, no. I mean, you're preaching a whole sermon on prayer? No, I don't want to hear it. I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm not coming to church today. Do you, do you do that? Is that, is that? is that the kind of Christianity you have? The Burger King Christianity? The only kind of Christianity you want is to have it your way? That's, look, that's you. That's not me. If that's you today, shame on you. This sh these things ought not be. Look, God has made us kings and priests unto God. So is a king for God supposed to be holy? Is a priest to God supposed to be holy? The answer is yes. So what are you doing drinking one drink? Why are you trying to justify one drink? Why are you trying to justify your kids drinking that one swig of alcohol once they turn 18 or once they turn 21? Who knows what the age limit is? At least the government knows how wrong it is. You, you ought not you know, feed kids alcohol at, at early ages. But nowadays, the government's so subjective, they're not even right about a lot of things. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is if the government knows can, can get that much, how much more should Christians take the higher ground? And, and, and the answer to that is carnal Christians, mainline Christianity won't. Christians will do what Christians want to do. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. It really doesn't. I mean, I'm, I'm being honest and sincere right now. It, the Bible, it, come on, I, I'm quoting the Bible right now. I'm, I'm, I'm in the Bible. People don't care what the Bible says. I say we're kings and priests. You know, people say, yeah, I, I, you know, you're, you're just, you just believe a book written by a man. And this is supposed to be somebody that calls himself a Christian, tells me that. I'm like, how, how are you a Christian when you don't even believe the word of God? Okay, so let's, go, let's keep going. I, I know I'm getting on some rabbit trails here, so let's just keep going. Okay, so we did Proverbs 31, 4 and 5. It is not for kings. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. So kings aren't supposed to drink. Does it say... They're not to drink it, or does it say they're, they're not to be in excess of it? One more time. Are they not to drink it, or are they not to be in excess of drinking it? Which one is it? Proverbs 31, 4, read it. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. They are not to drink it at all. At all. See, you see, where in the Bible does it say that you can't drink? Right there. We just quoted one. Don't drink it. All right, guys. Amen. Amen. It's got to be said, guys. Now, we're going to cover, we're going to cover Proverbs 31, 6 in a minute. Okay, notice I'm not running from any verse. Okay, um, we're going to cover Proverbs 31 6 in a minute. We will come back to Proverbs 31 6 because I have a whole little section just for you on Proverbs 31 6. Okay, so hopefully that'll be a blessing to you when you try to justify drinking and you go to Proverbs 31 6. Note that I will have a great answer for your contention on trying to justify your drinking. So let's keep, let's continue on. Now look at 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Now, where are we at right now? We're in the New Testament. We're under Paul preaching or writing a letter to the church at Corinth, which have both Jews and Gentiles contained in this church who are not Jews and Gentiles anymore. They are the church. Okay. Now he's saying to these people, these say the saved carnal Christians, he's telling them, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And look what he tells them to do and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. Do you, do you know what we're getting from 2 Corinthians 6, 17, according to the word of God, rightly divided? We are getting that when carnal Christians are touching unclean things, 
God does not receive them. I didn't say you weren't saved. I'm saying you are not received, meaning you have no relationship to God. Are you touching the unclean thing? Come on, are you? Are you touching the unclean thing? I, I, I want to let that soak in just for a minute. Now, now look, if you're touching the unclean thing, what would be classified as touching the unclean thing? Leviticus 10. Do not drink wine or strong drink, nor thy sons with thee, when ye go out into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. So there was a condemnation for and a punishment for drinking wine and strong drink in the tabernacle. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy. Now look, between unclean and clean. Now what did we just read in 2 Corinthians? Touch not the unclean thing. Now, doesn't that tell you not to drink wine? Doesn't that tell you not to drink strong drink? Yes. Now, the context of wine we're not supposed to drink, obviously, is fermented. The Bible says you're not to drink that. Okay, let that soak in. Leviticus 10.10 10 with 2 Corinthians. Okay, the one we just hit. 2 Corinthians 6.17. Touch not the unclean thing. I hope that's crystal clear to you. I mean, when I, read, when I first cross-referenced those... It was amazing. I was like, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, I am not supposed to touch wine or strong drink, period. Period. All right, let's keep going. How can someone saved drink wine when the word of God clearly says some Old Testament priests were erring, committing error by drinking strong drink? They couldn't think straight and stumbled in judgment. Isaiah 28, 7. Let's do it again. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priests and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Look, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Because it's unclean to drink this garbage. That's why. Now look at verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Do you see, what, you see what's going on there? If you're under the influence of drinking, even if it's a little bit, how are you going to teach anybody anything? How can you make anybody to understand doctrine when you violate doctrine in the Bible by drinking? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, we don't want you to teach our young ones. Your poor, lousy testimony of being a drunk because you, even if you drink moderately or one drink, you are a filthy testimony that I don't want you teaching my little girl. I don't want you teaching my family members. No, thank you. Who would, who would you rather have teach your kids? Come on. I did it before. We're going to do it again. Who would you have? Who would you rather have teach your kids? Would you rather have somebody that drinks moderately at home, Jack Daniels, uh, Seagrams, and wine coolers? Or would you rather have somebody teach your kids who, who only drinks grape juice, water, orange juice? That's all he drinks. Which one would you rather have teach your kids? No questions asked. Hands down. You would say the one that doesn't drink strong drink. There you go. See how easy that is? And, and, and you're going to tell me you're persuaded in your mind that it's okay to drink even if it's in moderation? You're a fool. That's what you are. You don't want to be called a fool. But you're a fool. If, you, if you're going to play around with fire. And think you're not going to get burned. You're a fool. Okay? So, so we did that. They have air through wine. And through strong drink are out of the way. So wine makes you air. Strong drink makes you out of the way. Come on. Notice it didn't say excess. Come on. Isn't your argument always excess? 
It doesn't say excess there. It just says, but they also have air through wine. Now, now, it could it could have been they air through wine by getting wine. Maybe they, they wanted to get wine, and by their desire and their corrupt attitudes towards wanting to get wine, that they did corrupt things and erred through truth. And through strong drink are out of the way. These people that drink strong drink, all their mind is focused on is strong drink, and they'll do anything to get it. They'll do anything to stay that way, including go against the word of God. The priests, or the priest and the prophet, have erred through strong drink. Didn't we just say this before? Are you a priest unto God? Come on, Revelation 5. We just said it. 5.10 and Revelation 1.6. Are you a king and priest unto God? And if the answer is yes, because that would mean you're saved, then the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. You want to you mess around with strong drink even a little bit? The Bible don't say that through excess of strong drink. It says through strong drink. You are not even to drink a little bit of it. You know how people swallow wine? The Bible says they are swallowed up of wine. That's, that, that's what's going on there. They are given to wine. That's what it means to be swallowed up of wine. Come on. They, people always say, well, I can stop whenever I want to. No, because your desire is to not want to. You don't want to stop. People always say, I can stop whenever they want to. But then their desires, they don't want to stop. And they won't stop. And even look, even if it's moderate drinking, they won't stop. Because they don't want to. Come on, it's not, it's not the, the fact they're addicted. It's the fact they don't want to stop. Come on, this is Bible only. We're, we're, we're not dealing in philosophy, okay? Bible only. You can, you can throw your philosophy in the garbage. The Bible trumps your philosophy, okay? For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. So notice Isaiah 28, 7. Let me flip the screen here. Look at it. They also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. Now look, we said it before. The priest... And the prophet have erred through strong drink. Didn't we just say in Revelation 5.10 and Revelation 1.6 that we are kings and priests unto God? We are not to drink it. You want, you want sanction to not drink it? Right there, Isaiah 28.7. If the priest of God's chosen nation, Israel, is not supposed to drink wine, then certainly the, the church whom Christ has chosen are not supposed to drink strong drink. We are priests unto God. There you go. See how we applied that practically? No, I didn't say I was an Old Testament priest. I said I'm a priest under God, under the New Testament, under Jesus Christ. And he tells me, be ye holy, for I am holy. There you go. You see that? Remember we said it was unclean? It was unclean? Look what it says. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. Come on. That's what our carnal Christians love. Full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Didn't we just say, touch not the unclean thing in 2 Corinthians 6, 17? Be ye separate, saith the Lord. What are you doing touching the unclean thing? You want sanction to not touch alcohol? I've been giving them left and right. But people don't want to stay on the scope to listen to it. Because they're too busy trying to justify sin. Exactly. Alright, so we did 2 Corinthians 617 Isaiah 28 7 now look at Daniel you guys remember Daniel in the Old Testament here Daniel did not want to defile himself with a wine which the king drank you know what we're dealing with the wine of Sodom that's what it's called there's a general term for this it's called the wine of Sodom and if you remember in our last scope we hit the wine of Sodom okay Come on, it's not, it's not in reference to, well, Sodom, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, they grew, you know, grape vines and they picked them and then we call this the wine of Sodom. No, it's a general term for any wine in the world that you drink that's fermented is called the wine of Sodom. And you know what I'm going to get? I'm going to get the true vine. Who's the true vine? Come on. Come on, this Bible quiz. Who's the true vine? Is it the wine of Sodom or the vine of Sodom or is it Jesus Christ? So which wine are you going to partake of? 
You can't have both, my friend. Which one are you going to partake of? You're going you're gonna to partake of the vine of Sodom or are you going to take the par part of the vine of Jesus Christ? No man can serve two masters. Either, either man love the one and hate the other or he hate the one and love the other. You can't have both. You can't have God and mammon. Can't have both. Which one do you want? Take your pick. And everybody that's a carnal Christian, and I'm saying most of them, I'm not, I'm not going to be conclusive. It's not all. There are people out there. The Bible says there, there's few out there that want truth. Okay. I understand that. But most, we're talking about the majority of people will say, I'll take the wine. There's no way you're going to tell me that I can't drink one drink. That's legalism. Do you see that? There you go. Let's keep going. Daniel 1.8. Let's do it. Now we're dealing in Daniel. Daniel did not want to devile himself with the wine which the king drank. Unfermented strong drink. Now look at this. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not what? Defile himself. Well, Daniel, you wouldn't defile yourself if you drank in moderation, would you? And Daniel, if you went to the closet where nobody could see you, you wouldn't weaken your brethren, would you? No, no, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Notice his heart isn't purposing him. He is purposing in his heart. He's controlling his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Do you see that? Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Notice there's nothing in there about excess wine. It just says wine. That could be a little bit. That could be a drop. He says he will not defile himself with a wine or of the king's meat. Do you see that? Look, I'm not reading anywhere in the Bible that it's okay to drink fermented wine. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's okay to drink it at your leisure. All right. See, guys, I'm telling you, this, this preaching, nobody likes this preaching because it goes against people's hearts. It goes against society. Right. Now, what does it mean to defile? Remember, we just read that. He did not want to defile himself. See, I, I got to highlight it right here. Now, let's highlight it. Look, defile himself. So what does, what is defile? Defile, according to the Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, would mean to make unclean, to render foul or dirty in a general sense, um, to make impure, to render turbid as the water or liquor is defiled, to soil or sully, to tarnish as reputation. Here's a little thought as we're reading this definition. What we just said in, in the other definition, the water or liquor is defiled. Do you know when you ferment something, you are defiling it? Did you know that? When you're, when you are going, you're undergoing the fermentation process of fruit, you are defiling and corrupting the fruit. And do you really think that when you're corrupting fruit, that when it goes into your body, even a little bit, it's not corrupting you? Let that, come on, just think about that. Soak that in just for a minute. There's a whole lot of preaching on wine, guys, in the Bible. And people people think, well, there's verses in the Bible that say drink it. All the verses you got that say drink it, I can go to all those verses and I can show you that it, it, they're not saying to drink alcoholic beverages. <laughs> Ain't it great, guys? Don't you just love to hate me? Sure you do. Because I love the I love the truth. And if you love the truth, then you're you're not gonna hate this kind of preaching. But if you hate the truth, then you're gonna hate this kind of preaching. Okay, so to make unclean, to render foul or dirty in a general sense, um, we're talking about the, the definition of defile, okay? So defiling oneself. To make impure, to render turbid as the water or liquor is defiled. To soil or sully, to tarnish as reputation. He is among the greatest prelates of the age. However, his character may be defiled by dirty hands. Notice that defiling always comes from uncleanness, unholiness, wickedness, and so forth. That's what defiling all always results from, okay? They, they shall defile thy brightness, Ezekiel 28. To pollute, to make ceremonially unclean. Notice that defilement, there's nothing good about 
defilement here. That which dieth of itself, he shall not eat to defile himself therewith. Leviticus 22. To corrupt chastity. Come on, to corrupt chastity. Ain't that what drinking does? It, it corrupts the purity of who you are in, in Christ. It sure does. To corrupt chastity, to, to violate, to tarnish the purity of character by lewdness. Shechem defiled Dina. Genesis 34, to taint in a moral sense, to corrupt, to vitiate, to render impure with sin, defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt, Ezekiel 20, he hath defiled the sanctuary of the Lord, Numbers 19, defile, to march off in a line or file by file to file off, and now we're in a, a, a secondary definition uh, of defile, but there you go, you see, you see what we're dealing with, nothing good, good comes from defilement, okay, so what did this wine do? The wine would defile Daniel and he knew it. So he didn't drink it because he didn't want to be defiled. Now, he, now, now guys, your argument is the king's meat, obviously. He didn't want to eat the king's meat because it was sacrificed unto idols. And so he didn't want to, to, to violate his holiness in relationship to God. Okay, As a Jew, um, they were not supposed to eat things offered to idols, okay? But look, he didn't drink the wine neither. Now, Jews could drink wine, but he didn't want to drink that wine because he didn't want to defile himself. Daniel did not drink fermented wine because it would defile him. Okay, so there we go. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is hard preaching for some people. Definitely. Okay, so... Wine is a mocker. Look, I'll flip the screen really quick. Um, we're not even preaching on Daniel 1 right now. Okay, here we go. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. So, wine is a mocker, but also can mo make people mock, correct? Come on, if you want to attribute mockery to the visual aspect or the physical aspect of wine in of, in of itself you could say well wine in of itself is a mocker i mean you could try to push that rendering which i wouldn't argue with it but here's what i say to that wine is a mocker but can also excuse me but can also make people mock correct sure it can strong drink is raging now drink in of itself may be raging in its corruption and in, in its and how it is um, as a a drink in of itself, okay, all by itself. But that's not what we're that's not what I'm reaching for, okay. We're reaching for strong drink is raging, but can also make people rage. Now, now where does anything good come from? Strong drink, Proverbs twenty verse one. Let's read it. I already quoted it to you. Now let's read it in the Bible. Now look what it says. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So it's a wisdom issue, number one. Number two, there can be deception involved if you don't think that Proverbs 20 verse 1 is true. So you're not wise, you're deceived, and if you're drinking it, strong drink, you're raging, and if you're drinking wine, which strong drink is a classification of wine, you're a mocker. A lot of negatives there, guys. A lot of negatives. Nothing positive. Notice it didn't say excess wine is a mocker. Notice it didn't say that. Come on, if your argument is in Ephesians 5.18 that be not drunk with wine where it is excess, what do you do with Proverbs 20 verse 1 that says wine is a mocker? And it doesn't say excess wine is a mocker. It doesn't say excess strong drink is raging. It says wine is a mocker, so don't drink it, because if you drink just a little bit, you'll be a mocker. You'll not only be a mocker in the sense of how much you drink may turn you into a mocker, you're a mocker because you're mocking God if you're trying to drink it and justify drinking even a little bit. You're mocking God that said don't drink it, and that's why people mock God. Come on, when people leave comments, do they not make fun of when I say don't even drink one drink because one drink makes you a drunk? You know what they do? They mock that. And you know what their wine is doing with them? Their wine, their desire to drink 
increments of wine, whether they want to classify it moderation or excess, whichever one they want to classify that as. Their wine makes them mock the word of God. Ain't that great? See how we applied that? That's great. Great application, by the way. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Notice it didn't say only the Jews. If the Jews are deceived thereby, they are not wise. It doesn't say that. It says whosoever. That means anybody. That means you today. You're deceived. If you think that you're getting away with drinking, moderate drinking, and you're not defiling anything. All right, guys, there we go. So we did that. So wine is a mocker, but also can mo make people mock. Strong drink is raging, but also can make people rage. Four of the five times in the Bible, raging is dealing with raging water or sea, which is not a good thing. Noah, Noah Webster's 1828 says raging is acting with violence or fury as a raging sea. Now look, here we go. One time the Bible is referring to strong drink. According to the word raging. Okay? So you got one time where raging is mentioned according to strong drink. But the other, the other times in the Bible, the other four times, it's dealing with the raging of the sea. The raging of the water. So what could we learn about strong drink being raging? Well, we could look at the ocean and the sea as it rages, and would we, in the middle of the ocean, as the ocean is raging against us, would we say that's a good thing, or would we say that's a bad thing? Nobody wants the ocean raging, the ocean raging against them, do they? No, they don't. Come on, go out to sea and say, wow, isn't it great that the ocean is raging right now? No, you're going to be like, well, there's a storm coming. We need to get away from this thing. We need to run, run from the, well, we can't run. We're in a boat. So turn on the motor, put it full throttle. Let's get out of here. So wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. When something is raging, you better get out of the way. You better not engage in it. You better not engage in something that's raging because it's just going to affect you. It's going to hurt you. Don't do it. Don't do it. There's the warning. So you got Psalm 89, 89.9. Let's do that. We're dealing in raging right now. Raging. Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. So, here's the idea. Why would God want to still the waves? Why would anybody, including um, David, you know, in, in Psalms, talk about how Stilling the waters would be a good thing. I mean, it doesn't say good thing there, but we're just saying according to our reading of the text, wouldn't the stilling of the raging sea and the waves coming and then God stilling them, wouldn't that be a good thing? Sure it would. Psalms 89.9. Now Jonah 1.15. Now look at this. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Why did they throw Jonah into the sea? Well, because they felt like it, or because the raging sea was raging in such a way that they were about to lose their lives on that ship. And Jonah, having sinned against God, not wanting to go to Nineveh to tell the Ninevites to repent caused God to cast judgment down upon Jonah and the men. And, and look, Jonah's sin affected the men that were on the boat. Did, did, did it not? Did not Jonah's sin affect all the people that were on that boat? He didn't want to serve God. So when God punished him, did it not affect everybody on the boat? It did. And when Jonah revealed the, the secrets of what was going on, they, they wanted to make sure God, the one true God, wasn't going to kill them. So they took Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Now, if raging is a good thing, why would they want the, 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 the raging sea to cease from raging? 
Well, because raging is not a good thing, and that's common sense. But, but for, a, for a Christian group of people in our day and age, in the Laodicean culture, the La Laodicean day and age that we're living in now, people don't understand that raging is a bad thing. Come on. In people's subjective opinions about, well, I don't think raging is a bad thing. You said strong drink is raging in Proverbs 20 verse 1. I think that's a good thing. I think that we all ought to rage. We ought to have a little bit of spice in our life. We ought to have an excitement in our life. Raging is a good thing. Okay, so you see why we're going here? We got to go here because we need to explain that objectively raging is a bad thing. Mocking is a bad thing. You know they mock Jesus Christ? <laughs> Do you really think mocking is good in the Bible? As they mock our Savior? All right, guys. I'm just saying. These, these, we're looking at a, a couple of descriptions, a couple of adjectives we're looking at right now. Mocking and raging. And it's attributed to strong drink and wine. And it's not a good thing if it's raging. Okay? So we dealt with Jonah. Now look at Luke 8.24. Look at Luke 8.24. And they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased. And there was a calm. Do you think the disciples were waking him up because they wanted the raging water to rage more? Or do you think that they woke Jesus up when the waters were raging so as to stop the raging of the water? So they didn't want the raging water, did they? So the raging water was a bad thing, and the calm is a good thing. You know what you're going to get when you get Jesus Christ? You know what you're going to get when you not only get Jesus Christ, but you live according to the principles of what Jesus Christ told you to live by? You're not going to get drinking devil drink. You're not going to get drinking strong drink wine. You know what you're going to get? You're going to drink the water of life. You're going to drink the true vine, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he can bring you peace. He can bring you a calm in your life that you never knew you had. But you know what you keep going to? You keep going to outside sources, outside bandages. You keep going to outside alleged problem solvers, and you think that a little bit of drink is going to calm you down. A little bit of strong drink is going to make everything okay. A little bit of strong drink can help you to mingle the right way with the, with the wicked crowd that you like to be around. And the Bible says, we ought to be separate, separate and holy unto the Lord. Our conversation should be in the heavenlies. Our conduct should be only that which becometh the gospel of Christ. Come on, you couldn't possibly teach me that wine makes you holy. Well, we're talking about Jack Daniels. You, you couldn't possibly teach that. But yet people, won't, people will leave a scope when you, when you preach against it. Why? Because Jack Daniels and all those wine coolers and all that Seagrams and all, the, all that fermented garbage is their God. Let's just pause right there. Soak that in, man. That's true. That is true, my friend. Now look, we did Proverbs. We we did Proverbs twenty one. We talked about mocking and raging according to strong drink and wine. Then we went to Psalm eighty nine nine to to expound on raging. Then we went to Luke eight twenty four to expound on raging and. Why would Jesus have to calm the raging of the water if it was a good thing? And again, Jude 13, we'll hit it again. Jude 13. So here it is. Raging waves of the sea. Let's go back. Um, let's, yeah, let's do ver verse one or Jude 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds, they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, 
wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So what are we dealing right here? We're dealing with these people that have gone out in the way of Cain. They are raging waves of sea. You see what's going on there? Raging waves of sea. Is raging a good thing in the context there? Obviously not. So guys, when we go to Proverbs 20 verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever deceived thereby is not wise. What you need to realize is raging is always a bad thing in the Bible. So why would you want something bad when the Bible explicitly gives attributes of Jesus, attributes of Christian conduct that are good things? Do you see how that works? Okay, so we did that. We did uh, the, the section on raging according to Proverbs 20, verse 1. So we did it. So you couldn't possibly go to Proverbs 20, verse 1 and, says, and, and, and try to come up with the assumption that you could drink, you could drink moderate drinking right there. It, it's, it's good for moderate drinking. And, you, 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 and then you go to Ephesians 5 and you say, but see, it says excess there. So you can drink moderately as long as it's not in excess. And then I argue with you about Proverbs 20, verse 1. It doesn't say excess wine is a mocker. It doesn't say excess strong drink is raging. It says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Okay, so hopefully I, I expounded on that and reiterated that enough so as, as to we have understanding. Because some people, guys, the reason why I say it over and over again is because sometimes you need to say it a certain way for somebody to understand it. And, um, but most of the time, people don't want to understand it, and that's not really the issue. But, but what I like to do is for those that are really trying to learn this is to say it in so many different ways as to maybe... Uh, go by their understanding and their logic and reasoning because sometimes people understand different levels of things and they may not understand it at plain face value. You may have to explain it a little bit more and a little bit more detail. So that's why I keep reiterating some truths and reiterating some precepts, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm doing my best, guys, to be able to get this in such a way where you can understand it, okay? So we got Proverbs 20, verse 1. Now... We did that. Now let's talk about wine in the sense of Psalms 69 7. Okay, so let's do that. Let's go to Psalm 69 7. And I'll flip the screen right here. And uh, here's what it says Because for thy sake I have been, I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Okay, so let's go down to verse 12. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. Do you know what we're dealing with right there? A prophecy in Psalm 69. A prophecy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of first advent. Okay? So there's our first advent prophecy of Jesus Christ. Um, David, David's writing this thing out. Prophesying of Jesus Christ. And you know what we got going on here? Jesus Christ was a song of drunkards. Now, what, guys, really quick. Do you think when these drunkards were singing a song, do you think that they were speaking a great song about Jesus and his holiness? Or do you think they were mocking? Which one? Come on. At face value, what do you think they were doing? Do you think they were mocking? Do you think drunkards would mock? Or do you think drunkards... How about this? Let me ask it this way. Are drunkards more likely to mock than not mock? All right, there you go. Sometimes you got to ask a question to, to get a, a, a heart's, a, a, a truthful aspect of the heart, okay? So, so there you go. So we did that. So we are not to hang around the wine crowd, are we? Proverbs 23, 20. Let's add on to this. Hear thou, my son, be and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine bibbers. What are you doing around drunks? What are you doing around wine bibbers? Why are you hanging out with them? 
well, you know, my best friend, you know, he only drinks when, 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 when he's at home, you know, when he's out and about with me, he doesn't drink. Does he drink when he's at home? Well, yeah, but I'm not with him. Don't hang around him. He's a wine bibber. See, 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 guys, this is what I'm talking about. People don't, people don't care what the Bible says. People just want to do whatever their heart tells them to do. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's why I always focus on the desperately wicked part. Because it truly is desperately wicked how many statutes and precepts and commandments that Christians break all the time knowing that the Bible teaches we ought to be holy and live our lives according to the word of God every day. But people don't care. And the Bible says, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. See, that, and, and that's the heart of man. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. There you go. The drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. Now, is it good to be a glutton? Is it good to be a wine bibber? No. You, you going to hang around them? No. Who are you going to hang around? People that aren't drunkards. People that aren't among right or people that aren't right, riotous eaters of flesh. Gluttonous people. You're not going to be around those. So there you go. Do you see that? Don't hang around drunkards. Do you drink today? You're a drunkard. I'm not to hang around you. You drink a sip of wine and you use 1 Timothy 5 to justify it. I'm not to be around you because that's, you're not taking that drink for your stomach, for your infirmity. You're not drinking NyQuil. You're drinking Jack Daniels and wine coolers. No, thank you. I am not to be around you. Even if you take a little sip of it, I smell it on your breath. I'm not, around, I'm not hanging around you anymore. I want to be around God's people. I want to be around Jesus Christ. And who are God's people? Those that have trusted Jesus Christ and believe that he died for their sins and rose again the third day, which are they are also called the body of Christ. I'm going to be around Jesus Christ. And what is the body of Christ? All the believers. You see that? So I'm going to be around people that honor God, not dishonor him. There you go. It's easy, guys. Easy. See, see, the problem is when, when somebody listens to a message like this, they're going to a church that says it's okay to drink. See, what you need to do, my friend, if you're in a church saying it's okay to drink, you need to go to a church that believes the Bible. Somebody's messing with your inheritance, and it's not me. <laughs> All right, guys, let's keep going. All right, so we did that, Proverbs 23, 20. Now, Proverbs 3, 23, 21, we did that. Now, look at, look at this one. Drunkard, in the Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary, is one given to sobriety or an excessive use of strong liquor. A person who habitually or frequently is drunk. There you go. So, a drunkard is someone who uses excessive wine. Now, that's according to Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary, in which I don't totally and, and utterly conclusively agree with that definition. Because according to the Bible, one drink makes you a drunkard. Now, notice I didn't say you're drunk according to the Western culture's definition of, of drunk. I didn't say you were drunk in that sense of Western culture's definition. I said you were a drunkard according to the biblical definition. Do you see that? So... So to say I don't drink to get drunk is a lame argument. Okay, here we go again. We're going to do it again. If I say I'm not a murderer and murder people, I'm still a murderer. If I say I'm not a drug dealer and sell drugs, I'm still a drug dealer. If I say I'm not an adulterer and cheat on my wife, I'm still an adulterer. If I say I don't drink to get drunk and then get drunk, I'm still a drunkard. See, see how that goes? All right, you guys, you got to say this over and over again because people don't get it. Excess wine makes you forget your poverty and remember misery no more till you sober up. Proverbs 31, 7. Let's do it. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Okay, so I, I, know, I know we said we're going to cover Proverbs 31, 6. 
and I kind of, I don't know why I did that in my notes, but um, I, I think I listed it as a point, a point of contention to not drink. And then later I cover the actual application of Proverbs 31, 6 and 7, okay? So let's just cover the point for now, and then we'll go back to Proverbs 31, 6, because I know you're dying to hear what is said about Proverbs 31, 6, because isn't that the sanction to drink? Isn't, come on, isn't that the verse we can go to to say, well, the Bible says to drink. It says give strong drinks. He actually says it. Okay, so we're going to cover that in a minute, okay? Now, now look, just one more, one more uh, supposition here about Proverbs 31, 6. This is the verse that people say that they use this one verse to say the Bible says all over the Bible that the Bible says you can drink. And they're thinking of that one verse right there. <laughs> you see that? They, come on, when they say everywhere in the Bible, it says, I mean, I mean, most places in the Bible, I mean, numerous places in the Bible, it says to give strong drink to people. And, I mean, it says it almost everywhere. And all you're thinking of is this one verse right here, Proverbs 31, 6. Okay, so we're going to cover that. I just, I'm just trying to draw more interest to that. Okay, so let's let's keep going. So let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. So excess wine makes you forget your poverty and remember misery no more. Till you sober up again, right? And then when you sober up again, guess what you remember? Your poverty. Guess what you remember? Your misery. Ain't that great? <laughs> no, it's not. You know, I, I'm not going to go there right now. We'll, we'll save this one. Now, now, now let's go to this next one. Habakkuk 2.15, another one that a lot of people use a lot of times, and it's, um, woe unto them, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink, or giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Now, wow, there is a whole lot of practical preaching here. There's a whole lot of, of ethics and conduct right here in this one verse. And the only thing that I really want to focus on right now, guys, I mean, we could do it, but we'll, we'll be here for the rest of our lives uh, preaching on these verses. But um, I definitely just want to hit the, the wine aspect of this thing. So woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink. So you are not to give your neighbor to drink, let alone give yourself something to drink. But that's the problem. That puttest thy bottle to him and makest him drunken also. So see, it says him drunken also, which means you're drunk. So you're drunk and now you're bringing other people to drink also. It's not good enough for you to drink. You've got to bring everybody else down with you. It's not good enough. Come on. It's not good enough for you to get drunk and to say, well, well, you know, I'm drunk. You know, I don't care what the Bible teaches. You know, I, I feel like I'm all guilty. I feel like, you know, I, I know I'm a Christian and everything, and I know I probably shouldn't be doing this. Let me drag another brother down with me and get him to drink also. So I don't have to feel as bad and, and feel like I'm justified because all my friends are doing it too, because I'm convincing them to drink also. Now, now let's go a step further. Now we got that aspect of it. Now look at another aspect. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also that. Now look, there's a that. Now here's the purpose of why they're doing it. That thou mayest look on their nakedness. Well, come on, what do people normally do when they're getting drunk? Well, the clothes are coming off. Why, do, why, why is the best selling of alcohol always in clubs and bars where people are in the dark and people are got disco lights on and they're dancing? And clothes are coming off. Come on, the women wearing skimpy clothes. They're, they're showing their nakedness. Do you see that? And they're, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get these women drunk so they can do what? To bring them a home to sleep with them so they can look on their nakedness. Ain't that great? Well, it's not great they're doing that, but it's certainly great to know that the Bible teaches against that. <laughs> Ain't that great? It is great. Praise the Lord that there's verses like Habakkuk 2.15. I can preach against you going out to the bar and giving your, you know, your neighbor something to drink so you can go home with her and sleep with her. Ain't that great? 
Isn't that what people normally do in daily lives? Christians go to the bar and they do the same thing as lost people do. They get a woman drunk and bring them home and sleep with them. It's pretty much what they do. And, and you want to condone that lifestyle because, because you love it. You love darkness rather than light because your deeds are evil. That's why, you, that's why you do it. Come on, I'm just preaching truth. I'm just preaching the Bible right now. That's it. Okay, so, so we did Habakkuk 2.15. Now, here, here's another argument people give. Look at, see the neighbor, see the word neighbor there? Well, does that mean the person right next door to you at your house? No, that would be Western culture's definition of neighbor. What is the Bible definition of neighbor? Come on, what is the Bible definition of neighbor? Would it be just the person that lives right next door to your house? Or, or, would it be Leviticus 10, 29, and 30? But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Isn't that the same question you're asking right now when you're dealing with alcohol and you're saying, well, depending on, so I can't give alcohol to my next door neighbor, but I can certainly give alcohol, you know, to somebody coming down to my store and be a bartender and sell it to them. No. You want to know who your neighbor is? It's anybody that's around you. Now, now look, watch this. Now we're dealing with the, the Samaritan here. Now watch this. Luke 10, 36. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? You remember, was it the Samaritan was it the, the Levite or was it the, was, what is the third one? We had a, we had a priest. So was it the priest? Was it the Levite or was it the Samaritan? Come on. That's where you get the good Samaritan from. The people, the, the lost world steals the term good Samaritan from, from the Bible. So, so look, what, who showed him that he was more neighbor to him? Was it the priest? the Levite or the Samaritan. And the answer, make a long story short, it was the Samaritan because that's why he's called the good Samaritan, right? So the Samaritan wasn't his next door neighbor living in his house. He was being neighbor to him because the, the, every neighbor that you have is a human being. That is your neighbor, a human being. Anybody that's a human being is your neighbor and you're not to give any human being Wine to drink. You want to give any human being strong liquor, anything fermented. There you go. Easy, guys. Easy. Come on. There's no justification for drinking wine, uh, fermented wine in the Bible at all. At all. The Bible again says, be holy for I am holy. God didn't say be holy and, and try to be holy because I think I'm holy because I still condone defiling myself with wine, uh, fermented wine. It doesn't say that. Be holy for I am holy. All right. So uh, holy is pure. It's without admixture. Okay. So, so we did that. Now. I wonder if we can cover this next section here. Um, here's what we'll do. We'll hold off on this next section. Um, we're going to end the scope here. I think it's, it's long enough. I mean, we covered a lot of information in this, this uh, period of time. Um, I, I hope, you know, you guys rewatch this. Let this all soak in. Um, these are principles right from the Bible. We are to have a biblical mindset, not a philosophical, worldly, secular mindset. Let's appeal to the Bible. Let's believe the Bible, okay? Go back, watch these things, watch the whole, the whole uh, wine study that I've just did recently, starting in the first study, okay? And work yourself all the way to here, and you'll see that nothing in the Bible contradicts. It's all, it all checks out, precept upon precept. We, we rightly divided our wine definitions, and so nobody can drink this strong drink and be justified saying that God condones it. Nobody can say that. Not with watching all the scopes that I've given, okay? I mean, thus far. And we're still headed, we're still, we still got a lot more information to cover, but we're going to stop here for now. I think we got a lot to, to soak in right now. Let's just dwell on the, the verses we just given. 
and then reread these things. Maybe at your house, you just open up your Bible and meditate on these things and pray and ask God to lead you in the truth with the spirit to understand these verses in their context. And God will show it to you. God will reveal these things to you if you want truth and you want to understand these things. Okay, guys, thank you for joining me on this very, very, very controversial, hard topic of wine, strong drink, and um, the defilement of these things, okay? Um, thank you for joining me. Um, again, um, go back, watch these things. I just, I promote you, I encourage you to have an open mind as you learn the Bible. You hear the world all day long. Uh, you hear TV, you hear you hear uh, worldly concepts, you hear philosophy all day long on your programs, on your internet. I'm just telling you, you don't hear the Bible being taught as much. And have an open mind as you go to these verses and keep in mind that God is holy. God will not give us anything or sanction us to do anything that is unholy. And if you're drinking even a small amount of wine, even a taste of it, the Bible tells you not to even look upon it, let alone take a taste. Don't even touch it. Don't even look at it. Okay? So there you go. I hope that may be edifying to you. Um, stay true to the Word of God. Have integrity when you're reading the Scriptures. Do not cherry pick. Do not cherry pick. That is my pet peeve. Do not cherry pick. All the verses that I gave, maybe I may give one verse here, one verse there. You go back and read those verses and you'll see that I didn't cherry pick those verses. They say what they mean even in their context. Okay? So you go back and study those things. Okay? So again, thank you for joining me on KJV Bible Scope. And may the Lord richly bless you guys. Y'all have a great, a great and wonderful evening.